Father in heaven, we come before you, God. We thank you in advance for what you're going to do, Lord. Help us to see things in a new way. We know when we experience it ourselves, Lord, we know what it feels like. But Lord, you want us to be able to help others too who go through it, who are making that cry, and to be able to tell them where to turn. You are the answer. Help us to see that today and all that you want us to learn. Help it to go down deep. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we're in Matthew 15. We're in verses 21 through 28. It's a short little story put in Matthew. It's not very long, but it's powerful. It's a powerful story because we're talking about an outsider who uh, won't let go of Jesus until, until. So let's look at verse 21. Thank you, Hannah. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And so what was that place? He was in Galilee. So leaving Galilee, you always need to know, what was they talking about before that, okay? Because he, he was talking to them about certain things going on in Galilee. So after he left that place, he comes to this place. And that's about in um, what is now known as Lebanon, okay? Lebanon. And these cities were denounced for their wickedness. They were full of pagan worship and everything like that. And where does Jesus go? Right into the, the heart of it. He is on his way someplace else, but right through the heart of that wickedness. And let's see what happens. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon possessed and suffering terribly suffering terribly. This woman is a pagan herself, but who does she recognize? She recognizes Jesus. She recognizes him. Her daughter is suffering, but even though she acknowledged who she was talking to, Jesus doesn't say a word to her. This, this for me, this was hard. I know this woman is an outsider, okay? I know that, but you know, you're thinking, wait, Jesus, you're for all. Has this ever happened to you that you cry out and you are not or feel you are not heard? You're crying out, you've prayed, and you seem to have no answer. There are times when God will immediately give you an answer. I was with some folks last night and we left a place and um we gathered in the parking lot of that place, and I said, well, let's pray before you leave so things can be different when you, uh, later this week when you get home or whenever God chooses. The prayer was for God to give some hope, because when you have no hope, you're ready to give up, right? You're ready to give up, and I think we've all been there. When there was no hope, you're ready to give up, but somebody else has to intercede for you. This woman is, has to intercede for her daughter, because her daughter probably can't have any hope because she's demon possessed, right? So she's interceding on her behalf. I wanna tell you though, that a couple hours later, I got a response from that person that said, look at God, things have turned around. I said, God, you're gonna do it that quick because he knows what you need when you need it. And there's a reason he's making you wait. And that's the part that's hard for us to take. Lord, don't make me wait. I need this to happen right now, right now. But he says, uh-uh, just like, uh-uh, it's going to rain. Uh-uh, I need you to wait a little. I need to, I need to see where your faith is. Her, she had a problem. That was one of her problems is that Jesus didn't answer. Her next problem was the disciples weren't helpful either. They weren't helpful either. You're going to see that as they said, you know, um, did I say that already? Yeah, the disciples came to him and urged him, send her away. Did I read this? Let me read this. I did touch on it. Thank you for paying attention. Hannah. All right, let me read this to you. It says in verse 23, Jesus did not answer a word. Shocking. So his disciples came to him. They're so helpful. Not sometimes, but not here, really. And they urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. We 
don't want to hear all that noise. She's causing a ruckus. Lord, send her away. You coming in between me and trying to solve my problem. I can't have you in between me and trying to solve my problem. And she couldn't either. So that was a problem for her. They weren't helpful. Send her away, they said. Her next problem was the way Jesus answers her. And this is what he says. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Girl, woman, I was only sent for this purpose. But she has a problem. That's not going to make her turn away. His assignment and his mission was only to the Jews, not to the Gentiles at this point. Remember that. But in Matthew, we later find we know that Jesus' grace is for everyone because we've been talking about that inclusiveness of Jesus. It is for everyone. But right at that moment, his mission was for the Jews. But he later, at the end of Matthew, what does he say? Take it to all the world. But that's only after he was resurrected. He was crucified and resurrected. But he says, now it goes to everyone. And they were given that authority. I don't know about you, but I think most people would have given up if he'd said that to me. It's like, oh, okay. Let me go find a doctor. Let me go find a, 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 a god since I'm a pagan, but she knew that those gods couldn't help her. And isn't that amazing that we will normally use Jesus as a last resort? The doctor can't do anything. My friends can't do anything. This homemade remedy can't do anything. Only God can. I wonder what else she had tried. I wonder what else she had tried. Let's go on. I don't know about you, I couldn't blame her if she walked away, because I might have walked away. I mean, truth be told, I don't know much about Jesus. If I don't know much about Jesus, oh, he didn't answer me right away? Okay, okay. But she didn't. She pressed on. She would not let anything get in between her and what she believed would be her remedy. She did not give up. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. Lord, help me. The word they use for knel kneel, to kneel, is in the Greek, I won't say the Greek word, but it also can mean to worship. She knelt down and she worshiped. She humbled herself before him. Lord, help me. Remember that cry from Peter? When we said, Lord, save me, and we said that that little short little bit has a lot. This has a lot. Same with Peter. It, it's brief, it's comprehensive, and it's direct. It's also sound doctrine because she is speaking to the only person who can help her. She didn't say, disciples, help me. Disciples, get out of the way. No, she's speaking to the one who can help her. And in our case, we're not on the telephone asking for advice from a friend. If we ask for advice, we're asking for prayerful intercession. Please pray for me. That's what we do. Every time we intercede on people's behalf, every time that you put that out there, it's not just about putting your business out there. Because remember, you don't have to say what's needed, but you know you need help. And to have more people bombarding the throne is important. And if you don't know anything about this church, we don't spread your business. We will pray for you, and you don't even have to tell us the specifics. We want God to hear. He knows already. It's personal, and it's an accessory, and it's urgent. It's interceding, and it's urgent. It's personal. Lord, help me. And it's effective, as we're about to see. It's effective. That plea of her heart is effective. She would not let go. Like Jacob, when he was wrestling with the Lord in Genesis 33, 
32, he said, you know, I'm not letting you go, Lord, until you bless me. Have you ever been that desperate? Lord, I'm not letting this prayer go until I receive a definite answer. I can't let you go, Lord, until you give me what some relief. Until I'm relieved, Lord. I believe God honors that when it's within his will, yeah, right? When he knows how desperate, how much faith you have in him, that he's the only one who can do it. This is a reminder to us to be persistent in our prayers. Don't just pray one time and leave it alone. And just because you didn't get the answer, pray fervently. Pray consistently. What's that in Thessalonians? Same thing. Pray always. Pray unceasing. Pray, pray unceasing. You know, I pray when I'm standing up. I pray when I'm at work. I pray when uh, it doesn't just have to be on your knees. Pray on your way to work. Pray when you're standing in front of somebody. Silently and out loud. Let me get the right, right words, Lord. Let me hear them clearly, Lord. Let me hear what they're saying. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Mm. In today's language, you would go like this. Did he just call me a dog and I'm a lady? You'd really walk away, right? He just called me a dog. But the way they used it then, it's not the way we use it now. And the Greek word for dogs that they used back then, the dog was like a little dog. A dog that could be on your lap like a puppy, like a sweet dog. I'm not thinking about that rabbit dog, rabbit, rabbit, going through the streets ready to bite somebody. That's not what it was about. It was about your pet. Sarah talked about your and Hannah's pet. It's about them. You're making sure that that dog has all the food that it needs, right? But he's saying, he said, it is not right to take the children's bread. So we're going to feed Hannah first before we feed our pet. Her dog, it's just the way it is. There's an order to that. I would look at you kind of strange if Hannah was starving and the dog was eating well. Okay? <laughs> just saying. All right? So first feed the children, then feed the dog. This is a comparison that Matthew put in there on purpose because the Canaanite people were thought of as dogs. And because... Canaanites and Israelites hated each other. So, you know, people got name calling that they do. They hated each other. So to even have her coming to him and have him say that to her, so he wrote it down that it was said to her, that shows you how desperate she is because she's willing to take even an insult that cuts deeper than just on the surface. It cuts deeper, but when you need something desperately, Lord, help me, how far are you willing to go? What are you willing to do? And then she says this. Her faith was put to the test, and she rose to the test. Yes, it is, Lord. She said, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. So basically, she said, I'll take whatever you throw out. Because I know whatever little bit I get from you, she will be helped. She will be healed. And I will gladly sit there and wait for it. That's desperation. She was desperate, but she was also humble. She was also humble. She also called him and knew him, Lord. She knew who she was talking to. She needed his grace. And she did not allow anything to stand in her way. Not her race. Okay, not her race. Hello, hello. Oh, my word. Hello, hello. Good to see you. We've got a lot of beautiful children who just came in. And dad, good to see you. 
She didn't let anything get in her way. Nothing. It was good. Want to? Hey, kids, do you want to go to children's church? Yeah, they went, yeah. Say, we don't know nothing about no Canaanite woman. Go ahead with Miss Sarah. If you guys go ahead with Miss Sarah, she'll take you right into the room. Follow her. You know where it is. Mm -hmm. It's always so good to see you guys. Zozo. Follow Miss Sarah. You don't want to miss it. Going on. <laughs> she didn't let her race get in the way of asking the Lord for what she needed. She didn't let the Lord's silence get in the way of what she needed. She didn't let the disciples wanting to dismiss her getting the way of what she needed. She didn't even let her pride get in the way of what was needed. How many times do we let one of those things get in the way of what we need from the Lord? There would be no, nothing that will stop me when my husband is possibly having a heart attack, right? If someone, if those guys had said, we're not taking her to the hospital, not taking him to the hospital, I would have got, oh, yes, you are. <laughs> oh, yes, you will. You become someone else. When it's your children, your loved one, you become someone else who will fight for what is needed to get it taken care of. All those things jump out the window. You want the best for your loved ones. And Jesus wants the best for us. He wants the best for us. So it reminds me of the soldier. Remember the soldier who said, Lord, you don't even have to come to my house. She said, I'll take the crumbs from the table. The soldier said, Lord, my servant is ill, but you don't have to come to my house to heal him. All you got to do is give the word. That's the other thing. Lord, you don't have to do a great deal, but give the word and he'll be healed. Give the word and this situation will be taken care of. That's how powerful Jesus is. He's the God of the universe. There is nothing that is outside of his preview. He has all authority. The problems that we have, the difficulties that we face, he can fix. But why is he taking so long to do it? Because he's checking to see, do you know who you're talking to? And do you really have faith in me? And remember, when you come to the end of your rope, you need to say, I'm telling you, Lord, I need a little light because I can't keep going. I can't keep going. Give me a little hope. Let me see something that shows me your promise. Have you ever been that desperate? Can you understand when people say that to you? Can you understand somebody in the street, um, a homeless person, a person with mental illness, a person who doesn't act the way that you think they should act? Don't you know what they need? But we get so judgmental. Ooh. You think they want to be there? Do you think they want to be in that desperate situation? Do you think people want to be without a job? Everybody says, well, they don't find one because there's something else going on inside of them. They have no hope. They don't know the promise that we know. It's our job to give them that hope, to give them that promise, and to help them along the way. Because quite frankly, when we're down, there's someone who helps us. We're so fortunate we have each other. We really do have each other. That is a blessing. But can we be that for others outside of this room? And have you been that for others? And I know that we have, and you have. Jesus had her exactly where he wanted her, desperate. And she was ready to hear. And he was ready to meet her at her need. 
when I say desperate, to the point of where she knows there's nothing else. It's not that he's trying to punish her, but because she had to wait, because she had to wade through it, she got to see, man, my faith is strong in this man. I do believe, and he got to see it in her. He got to see it in her. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Not just faith. He said, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. Why did it work for her and not for me? In other situations, right? I told you about when I thought my mother would be healed. I said, when they take her off that machine, she's going to breathe. And God said, no. And I'm telling you, I looked around and I said, what? And then I understood. God said, mm -mm, time for her to go home. No more suffering, no more pain. And when you see her again, she will be whole. That only takes away a little bit of the pain, right? A little bit of the heartache. Jesus healed this woman's child. Jesus has healed us. We've seen the healings before. Jesus has healed our loved ones before until he didn't. And there is a place and a time for mourning, but her time right now was for rejoicing. And he put that in there for a reason. That was something we needed to see, something we needed to read, something we need to know. Can you muster up that kind of faith? I don't think so. You got to depend on Jesus to even have that faith. Her faith was great, but so was her desperation. It was great. And this time, God granted her request. And there are times when he didn't. I don't, you know, we don't highlight those times when he doesn't all the time. We highlight those times when he does. But for every time he does, you can guarantee there were times when he didn't. When he didn't. Jesus held and holds all the power. He holds all the power, but he is a loving God. He is a loving God that hears you. He's a loving God that sees you. He's a loving God that answers you, but not always in the way that you want. He was a male and she was a female. For him to even address her was unnecessary because he didn't address women a lot. But we know that Jesus did. She creatively pushed back against what he said to her. She, she pushed back. Do you know how you give the word of God back to God? That's why you should know scripture, because you can say back to him, Lord, here's your promise, and I know what your promise is. Your promise is blank, blank, blank. I will never leave or forsake you. Your promise is that you will hear my prayer. Your promise is that you died for my sins, and I am saved. You promised me that. And you can never go back on your word. Then you start reading scriptures where it goes down like that. Like, Jesus, for this Canaanite woman, you did this. I'll take the crumbs from your table, too. Jesus, I'm looking for you to pull me through this. What are you looking for? He had the privilege to dismiss her, but he didn't. We have the privilege to dismiss other people, but we shouldn't. He created a space for a conversation with this woman. Can we create a space? Is this church a space where we can have those kind of conversations? And outside of this space, can we have those kinds of conversations of even disagreement with people? I love the way he did that. We're to be disciples. And he says, making disciples. So part of this was for us, but part of this is for us to go out and do the same for someone else. And do the same for someone else. Could it be that in our act of making disciples, we find out more about exactly who Jesus exactly is? 
Because when we go out and talk to people, we get to see who he is in their life, as well as who he is, who he is in our lives as we're talking to them. We learn more about ourselves by sharing our act of faith with people. We grow and we learn by helping others. It gives us a place to apply what we're learning right here. This isn't just for you to go home and feel good, but I guarantee you're going to run into somebody this week that you got to say, listen, let me tell you, I don't have the answer. I don't, but I know who does. I can't fix it for you. I can't, but I know who can. Are you willing? We'll get things wrong as much as we get them right. We'll get things wrong as much as we get them right. That's within these walls and without of these walls. You're not always going to get it right. I'm not always going to get it right. But we're going to grow and we're going to learn. And we're going to be inviting people in who are not perfect inside these walls. And they're not going to act like us. They're not going to look like you. They're not going to look like me. Jesus was talking to a Canaanite. Come on. As a black woman. A black woman. And he had time to heal her daughter. Do we have time to speak to those who look different from us? So my prayer is that we make the time. My prayer is that we continue to grow in faith and help others to do the same, regardless of their status, gender, appearance, or their understanding. If they don't get it, they don't get it. You're not opening their eyes. God is. All you do is just continue to just love them, not press them, not beat them in the head with it. Just say, hey doesn't matter to me. I love you anyway. I love you anyway. And what compels us to do it is God's love. It is love that compels us to do it. As we follow the lead of Jesus Christ, may we go out of here sharing that love with everyone. And when they say, Lord, help me, I know what they mean. We'll be able to throw our arms around them and pray with them. We'll be able to guide them to the one who has that answer. Amen? Amen.